Next, from Springfield, at a luncheon hosted by the State University's Annuitants Association, Charles Wheeler, a public affairs reporting professor at the University of Illinois Springfield, discusses the politics behind the budget standoff in Springfield. This runs about 45 minutes. I'd like to introduce Charlie Wheeler, and he's going to give you a little bit of his perspective about what's going on in Springfield. <laughs> It's hard to sort out, folks, but I know that Charlie has a grip on it, and he's got years of experience to tell you just what that is. Thank you, Linda, for that glowing introduction. Does anybody hear me okay? Uh, well, as Linda said, I've been watching state government since Richard Ogilvie was a newbie governor. Uh, yeah, grown, grown. Luckily, there are some of you who are uh, experienced enough to remember that, <laughs> unlike my students for whom that ancient history. Yeah. Back with the Egyptians and the, the Romans and so on. So I've been watching this stuff since 1969. I was a reporter for the Sun-Times for 24 years. Uh, Michael Madigan and I started together, so to speak. His first elected office was as a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. That was my first major assignment for the Sun-Times. And then I've been at the university since the fall of 93. Uh, and my program prepares students to be reporters. Uh, roughly half of the current Capitol Press Corps are graduates of my program. Any given day, I can pick up the Chicago Tribune and see bylines, two or three of people have gone through my program. Uh, so I've been focused on this for a long time. Um, and let me tell you, from all of those years of observing state government, it's given me absolutely no preparation, no insight for what we're living through now. So my, to give you quite a bit of insight on the spring legislative session, so I will try to do that, but as I say, it's like being in a whole new world, all this other experience where you could kind of say, okay, this is kind of like what's gonna happen. It doesn't count for anything anymore. It's kind of scary. Um, the governor gave his own appraisal of the legislative session the day that, I guess it was the day after lawmakers adjourned on May 31st. He referred to it as a stunning failure. And it probably was, but let me just mention a few things that didn't get highlighted, but which could be looked at as being accomplishments. One of the things that the state did, or the legislature sent a bill to the governor to do, and the governor's indicated he'll probably sign it, was to extend the trial period for a medical marijuana law and to add another couple of other conditions, one of which is a, a post-traumatic stress disorder, which will benefit people greatly, I think, particularly veterans who've, who've gone through the, the um, wars in uh, Iraq and, and Afghanistan. So that went to the governor. He, there's also legislation, again, the governor has indicated he'll probably sign it, to decriminalize possession of small amounts of marijuana. The notion being that somebody who's caught with a few grams of pot shouldn't have a criminal record that would impede their ability to go on, uh, qualify for a lot of professions, get different licenses, and so on. Uh, there's also legislation for automatic voter registration. So when someone shows up for their driver's license or shows up at some state agency, they will be registered to vote, which is seen as a way to increase participation in our democracy. Although I have to say, being registered doesn't necessarily guarantee that people will show up at the polls. But it's good to have the opportunity to register people. Uh, there is legislation to say that folks who are part-time members of county boards no longer qualify for pensions, which was a reform that uh, was spearheaded out of McHenry County up, up in the uh, northern part of the state. There was another legislation headed to the governor that would re that basically eliminate the sales tax on feminine hygiene projects, products. 
the so-called pink tax. Uh, and then there was another one that had bipartisan support to increase penalties for people who are gun traffickers, which is a real problem in the Chicago area. Guys who will go across the state line to Indiana, buy a bunch of guns, bring them back into Chicago, and peddle them on the street. So th those are all positive things that the General Assembly did. And so if you want to analyze the session in a more complete fashion, you have to look at those accomplishments. Now, that said, I'll get into ripping them. Uh, the, the major task of a governor and a general assembly each spring is to prepare a budget, a spending plan that allocates the state's resources to cover the services and goods that the governor and legislators believe constituents want. Every governor from 1818 all the way through Rod Blagojevich and Pat Quinn managed to get that done. Now up until Ogilvy's time, we had biennial budgets. So the legislature in the, would come in in January of the odd numbered year, pass a budget for two years, go home. Ogilvy moved us onto annual budgets. Every year since then, we've prepared a budget been passed, signed into law, and the state has moved accordingly. That didn't happen a year ago. And so for the first time in state history, we've operated to this point no authorized spending plan for the entirety of state government. Now, this fiscal year ends on June 30th at the stroke of midnight. Fiscal 17 begins. There is no budget in place for fiscal 17 either. So in that sense, uh, the legislative leadership and Governor Rauner have been failures of, what would you say, of, of unprecedented sorts. As a matter of fact, there's been no state in the history of this nation that's gone a full year without a budget. And we're, what, nine days away from that. Um, part of the problem, I think, is the folks who are responsible for this know what has to be done. They just don't have the courage to do it. And they want to blame the other guy for when it happens. So I've said on, on occasion, it's an example of profiles in cowardice. <laughs> what needs to be done is we have to raise taxes, we have to cut spending, and we have to kind of dig ourselves out of the hole that we're in. I checked the comptroller's website before I came out here, and we are roughly have a bill backlog of roughly $7.9 billion, where the, the, the bills are there on Leslie Munger's desk, and she doesn't have the cash to be able to write the check to cover them. Some vendors are waiting close to a year, some of them even more to have the state pay for the things that they in good conscience provided to the state. And because of the late fees we're having to pay on this stuff, we've run up like a billion dollars over the last, well, since the turn of the century, late fees because we can't pay people on time. So we know what needs to be done, uh, but we've not been able to do it. Now, Governor Rauner blames the Democrats for not giving me a balanced budget. The fact of the matter is Governor Rauner has yet to propose a balanced budget. The one he proposed a year ago, February, was out of whack by roughly $3.5 billion. Uh, by law, the governor is supposed to prepare a spending plan based on what the statutes say today, not what the statutes might say if I can change them. And he's supposed to use the revenues that are coming in as of today, not what they might be if I can jiggle the law to accomplish some things. So if you may recall, the governor decided he was going to save a couple billion dollars by, quote, pension reform, by in essence shorting people benefits. I'm sure you guys are more aware of it than I am. And he also was going to save like seven, eight hundred million dollars by shorting the money that local governments receive as part of the state's income tax collections. 
part of the deal in 1969 that led us to have an income tax was Mayor Daley and Governor Ogilvie, Daley a Democrat, Richard J. Ogilvie a Republican, actually were able to negotiate. They were able to work out a deal for the income tax. Daley had Democratic lawmakers vote for the Republican governor's income tax bill, and in return, the city of Chicago, the county of Cook, other cities and counties across the state got a slice of the revenues from this new income tax. And that's been on the books ever since. And Governor Rauner decided we'll just keep a big chunk of it, roughly half of it. Uh, but to do that, you have to change the law. So that budget was out of whack. Democrats passed a budget with no new revenues that was about $4 billion out of whack. They at least admitted, yeah, we didn't pony up the money to cover this, but this is what we think we ought to spend. This last February, the governor put forward a budget that proposed spending roughly three and a half billion dollars more than what this would be. And how did he cover it? He put a line in there, uh, make sure I get this right. It was uh, government management and savings for three and a half billion dollars without spending, or spelling out exactly what was in there. So that was kind of funny, I thought. So neither side has clean hands in, in this situation. Before the legislature adjourned, uh, the House sent a budget plan to the Senate, or I should back up. Despite the fact that there's no spending plan in place, no total budget enacted for this current fiscal year, we've been spending money left and right, roughly at 90% of what the levels were in fiscal 15. And the reason we're doing that is because certain things by law get paid, even if the legislature doesn't appropriate a single nickel. For example, contributions to the five uh, public employee retirement systems for which the state is the employer and by law makes the employer's contribution. Teachers retirement be being the biggest one, I'm not sure if uh, university retirement or state employees is the next biggest, but the state makes those payments. And the way the law is written, even if the legislature doesn't appropriate a nickel, the comptroller automatically sends the money to the retirement systems. Same things with debt service. We borrow money, the people who buy our bonds get paid, regardless of whether there's an appropriation or not. So that money goes out, whatever. Over the course of the last several decades, we've also been sued in federal court by various groups, uh, basically advocacy groups for people relying on human services, saying that the federal law says you have to do this. State of Illinois, you're not doing it. And the state has said, well, we won't admit that we haven't been doing it, uh, but we'll do it in the future. And they sign these consent, excuse me, these consent decrees. And so that money flows no matter what. And a big, big, what would you say, uh, development was when a, a circuit judge in St. Clair County said uh, state employees have to be paid doesn't matter whether there's any appropriation for it, they still have to be paid. Now there were kind of arcane reasons behind that, one of which is that under federal law, some people would have to get minimum wage, and our records are so antiquated, we can't tell who falls into that category. And so we, we, we don't really know who should get, who qualifies under the federal law, what are we gonna do? And the judge says, okay, just pay everybody. And so that's where we are. And so those kinds of, uh, what would you say, statutory provisions, those kinds of consent decrees, those kinds of court orders, plus the governor did sign one piece of the budget. He signed funding for elementary and secondary education. All of that stuff that we're seeing at the rate of roughly $36 billion a year. We have roughly $32 billion coming in. So right away you see that there's a, there's a problem and that's what needs to be addressed. And it hasn't been. And it's, it's been sort of a, a, a blame game. And it's gonna get worse if we don't get something done by June 30th. Because over the course of the last year, particularly in most recent months, legislature has done some piecemeal stuff. They passed legislation saying, okay, uh, 
agencies, you can spend the federal dollars that you get. Even though we don't have a full budget, you can spend the federal dollars. They've told, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the General Assembly has, has put together some emergency money to help some other agencies survive and get by. Uh, we finally, at long last, gave a pittance to higher education. Roughly 30% of higher education would get in a normal year. Uh, and it may not be enough to save some of our schools. Eastern in particular is in jeopardy, Chicago State, Western. But all of those emergency things, the federal money, higher ed money, money for human services, all that stuff, the authority to spend ends when the clock strikes 12 on June 30th. And so that is gonna be a pressure point. I mentioned earlier, the governor signed a budget for elementary and secondary education. If there's, and, and again, that authority ends on June 30th. If there's no budget for the next fiscal year, will schools be able to open on time? Big question. They're already talking about uh, how road projects are gonna be delayed. There was a news conference with a group called the Transportation for Illinois Coalition which is made up of the business community and organized labor that's urging the state to invest more in infrastructure, roads, bridges, and so on. The authority to spend money for ongoing projects ends on June 30th. So the Department of Transportation is warning, we're just gonna have to shut everything down if we don't get any more spending authority. So that's uh, kind of the situation in, in which we find ourselves. And so we're, we're playing a blame game. Um, the governor on the one hand says, I'm not gonna do a budget unless I get my turnaround agenda, uh, which the Democrats say, well, those pro-business changes you want are gonna hurt working people. You do away with the prevailing wage, yeah, maybe local governments can save money on projects, but on the other hand, the folks who actually go out and do the work are gonna get paid less. And so you have less money going into your economy in the community. How does that help anybody in the long run? So there, there, that kind of dialogue going on. The Democrats say, let's do a budget and then we'll negotiate this other stuff. Um, and as I said earlier, everybody knows what needs to be done. We have to raise taxes and we have to make cuts in the programs. Difficulty is that the general public doesn't seem to see it that way. The Paul Simon Institute down at Southern Illinois University Carbondale does polls periodically. And I guess it was last week they released a study where they've gone back years to see what's the tenor of the people. And their conclusion was, probably not surprisingly, people want more stuff and they don't want to pay for it. <laughs> and so the, the political scientists who did this suggested that, well, maybe the public attitude is, is a problem too. And I would say, yeah, it kind of is, but on the other hand, that's fostered by politicians of both parties who feed them this line of malarkey. Most people are very busy with their lives. They have families, they have jobs, they have to worry about how I'm gonna make the mortgage payment, particularly in this, in this climate when middle class people are being hollowed out. They don't have time to sit down and analyze the ins and outs of the state budget or the state revenue structure. So when somebody tells them, oh yeah, we'll just cut the waste out of government, Oh yeah, we ought to do that. We ought to cut out that waste. I like to tell people there really isn't a guy in the basement of the state house shoveling hundred dollar bills into a furnace. <laughs> and there's no line in the budget that says waste, mismanagement and abuse, $500 million. It doesn't work that way. And if we want these services, we have to be willing to pay for them. If we don't want to pay for them, then we have to agree some of these services we're gonna to have to cut back on. Now, kind of cynically from watching this stuff for many years, I came to the conclusion that waste in government is any program uh, from which I don't personally benefit. <laughs> and so, do I care if there's a DuCoin State Fair? No, why should I care? On the other hand, do I care if there's money for elementary secondary education? I do now. Um, 
I guess I always did, even though I didn't have kids. My kids all went to Catholic schools. My grandkids are in public school. But I always thought that education was a good investment, regardless of whether your kids personally benefited it, because it's good for the community and it's good for society. So I was always a big fan of putting money into education. Um, the governor goes about these negotiations, I think, in the wrong way. Because as I said, everybody knows what has to be done. Uh, people are too busy trying to blame the other guy. So the governor had this tour around the state after the legislature adjourned. First stop was Vienna. And what's his message? Oh, those Chicago Democrats, Mike Madigan, the people controlled by Mac Mike Madigan. Your legislators controlled by Mike Madigan. They want to take money out of Southern Illinois and send it to Chicago. Um, you know, this is a bailout for Chicago schools and so on and so forth. And he said this in Vienna. And just to be contrary, I actually went to the website of the Illinois State Board of Education where they have very detailed analyses of every local school district's finances and other things besides you know who their kids are, that kind of stuff. And lo and behold, the city of Chicago gets something like 34, 35% of its resources from the state. Vienna gets 45%. Marion, another town that the governor cited, gets 45% too. So I'm thinking to myself, if I were a reporter, I would have put this in the story. And if I were a staffer for the government, I would have made darn sure that the example I'm using was one that was really realistic. Now, there are some school districts that get less than 2% of their money from the state. A school districts in Oak Brook, Lake Forest, Kenilworth, Wilmette. And one could argue they're, they're able to provide them for themselves a pretty decent education for kids. So the governor is doing this. The, the governor has bad mouth the legislature and individual leaders. He's referred to Madigan and Cullerton, John Cullerton, the Senate president, as being corrupt, being crooks. He even suggested the Illinois Supreme Court was corrupt. And so one wonders, uh, l l let's say that we're going to have some negotiation. Uh, I might think that you're a jerk, but I'm not going to say to you, man, you're really a jerk. Now let's sit down and, and see what we can work out. It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> and he blames Madigan. He says that Madigan's responsible. Madigan's controlled the state for the last 30 years. And I'm thinking, last 30 years, we're, 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 we're 2016 minus 30, that'd be 1986. Who was governor in 86? Oh, yeah, it was Jim Thompson. Did Jim Thompson feel that he was controlled by Mike Madigan? And fast forward to the 90s, when Jim Egger was governor, and Pate Phillip was the Senate president. I don't know if any of you remember Pate Phillip. If you've ever met him, you'd never forget him. And I've suggested to reporters, you ought to call up Pate and ask him if he thought he was a tool of Mike Madigan. <laughs> now, the response you get, you would not be able to air or put into a family newspaper. But the gist of it would be no. <laughs> and you look at Madigan's record of working with past Republican governors. Most of the time Madigan's been speaker, there's been a Republican governor. And most of the time there was a Democratic governor, Madigan was on the outs with him and ultimately impeached the guy. Ask Jim Edgar when he tried to reform the state school aid formula, the most serious effort made in all the years I've been watching this. Mike Madigan pushed Edgar's bill through the General Assembly. It came over to the Senate. Pate Phillip killed it. So the notion that Mike Madigan runs things, I, I think, is, is not actually true. Now, the governor would like to be the guy who runs things, but in our divided government, you have the executive branch, obviously, legislative branch, judicial branch. The governor controls most of the executive branch. He has to deal as co-equals with the Senate and the House. And as I said, it does not help your cause to be bad-mouthing these people when you're supposed to sit down and negotiate with them. It doesn't help 
get support for your agenda to be attacking lawmakers across the state as being tools of Mike Madigan. I suspect that people in Southern Illinois who dealt with Senator Forby, Representative Phelps, Representative Bradley on a daily basis on a lot of issues over time, they hear somebody on the radio or they hear some robocall, he's a tool of Mike Madigan. They're gonna dismiss that because they know from their experience that it's not true. But that's kind of the game that's, that's going on. Now, ideally, based, as I said, on my long history of watching this stuff, I'd say, well, what, today's the 21st? Yeah, we got nine days, they'll get it done. Uh, you know, back when it was people like Edgar, George Ryan, Madigan, or Phil Rock in the Senate, late Phil Rock, God bless him. They were folks who, who fought tooth and nail at the beginning of the session, about midway through, they'd say, time out on all this partisan nonsense. Let's sit down and work out what we can do for the state of Illinois, and they get something done. Um, I'm not sure that's there. And I think the elements for a compromise exist if people are willing to embrace the notion of reaching a compromise. Now, there are working groups made up of rank and file lawmakers sitting down to hash out some of this stuff. Uh, budget stuff and also some items on the turnaround agenda. Take workers' compensation. There's no reason why some agreement couldn't be made to limit the costs to employers of workers' compensation without undermining the well-being of injured workers. Uh, one of the things that I find interesting is that the Illinois Workers' Compensation Commission, which is an agency of the governor, studied the results of reforms that were enacted in uh, 2011, I believe. And it said that as a result of these reforms, not all of which are fully in place, uh, the costs to insurers have gone down 17% in Illinois, the largest drop of any state in the union over that time. The employer community says, hey, we don't see that in our premiums. Democrats suggest, well, maybe we ought to take a look at those premiums and see on what they're based. Maybe there ought to be more review of the insurance companies. That might be an area. Uh, another factor is causation. Uh, employers complain that, well, we just hired Wheeler, and he's 60 years old, and, and he's spent all his life you know, using a sledgehammer, and so obviously his wrist and his hands are kind of screwed up. He's worked for us for six months, and now he's got a problem with his wrist. Why should we have to pay the full cost of that? And there may be a point there. But on the other hand, you want to say, okay, Wheeler, you're out on your own. Uh, yeah, you, you dinged yourself up all that time for all these other people, but your latest employer isn't going to pay for that. Maybe what we need to do is do what we do in unemployment insurance. The state runs an unemployment insurance program where employers pay basically two different taxes or fees, whatever you want to call it. One is based on their own employment history. How many people have I laid off over the last, what is it, a couple years? The other is based on what's the overall climate in the state. So maybe what we could do with workers' compensation is say, okay, the company that has Wheeler last pays a proportion of it. But every company in the state kicks into a fund that's used to make up the difference so that the last employer doesn't get stuck with the whole tab, but the injured employee is made whole. I don't know if that would work, but that's the kind of thing you gotta be thinking about. And again, back in the day, that was the kind of issue where representatives of the business community, representatives of organized labor, would sit down, hash this stuff all out, and they'd come to the legislative leaders and the governor and say, here's what we agreed on. And it was called an agreed bill process. It would be turned into legislation, it would zip through the House, zoom through the Senate, governor would sign it, and that would be it. That's how you get this stuff done. And we all know if you're going to raise taxes, you have to look at the income tax. So what you do is you maybe put the income tax back to where it was. Maybe you put a tax on services. Um, unlike all our neighboring states, we tax very few services. I Wisconsin every summer. Last year when I was up there, the brakes failed on my van. So I went and got them fixed, and I had to pay a service tax. 
basically the state sales tax, Wisconsin sales tax, on the labor of the mechanic who fixed my brakes. Here in Illinois, I wouldn't have had to pay that tax on labor, only on the parts. But on the other hand, I didn't want to drive 500 miles with no brakes, so <laughs> what could I do? But, but there are things like that. Uh, some of our taxes are high, our property taxes are very high relative to other states, but it's also because the money we invest at the state level into our schools is towards the bottom, if not being at the absolute bottom of the barrel among states. So yeah, local property taxes are high because the state doesn't do its share of funding elementary and secondary education. And our income tax rates are not exorbitant. Our tax rates are lower, our individual income tax rates are lower than all our neighboring states, save Indiana. And Indiana has a local sales or local income tax on top of the state one. So it's it's not that our taxes are so high. It's that our revenue structure is kind of out of sync. So you look at the revenues, you decide here's how much money we need to do the the essentials that we want to do, and you sit down and you say, okay, we're going to vote for it. Now, people have said, oh, an election year, legislators voting for a tax increase, ooh, that's scary. I would argue um, it shouldn't be a real concern. One of the reasons I say that is because I actually went back and looked at every roll call for an income tax increase or, or imposition, going back to 69 with Ogilvy's tax, 83 when Thompson raised it, 89 when we raised it again under Thompson, 90 and 91 when a temporary tax was made permanent under Edgar. And I found out that the people who voted yes for those tax increases or to make permanent the rate actually got reelected at a higher percentage than the people who voted no. And so you might say, that's counterintuitive. Why would that happen? The reason is those were structured roll calls where the party leaders sat down and they said, uh, okay, Republican leader, you're going to put so many yes votes on. Democratic leader, you're going to put so many yes votes on. And so I'm the Republican leader. And I look around and say, uh, yeah, you're in a safe district, you'll be yes. Oh, you're a shaky district, you'll be no. You'll be yes, you'll be yes, you'll be a no. And so the people who voted for it were people who were safe. The people who voted no were in shaky districts, and some of them lost. The most recent income tax increase we had, the one that was pushed through with Pat Quinn that moved us up temporarily to 5%, I went and looked at the results, the next election for those people who voted for it. Of the people who voted yes, one Chicago Democrat lost in the primary, and they were all Democrats, by the way. Everybody else on the ballot won. There were a handful of Republicans who voted no who lost. So go figure. And, and what I would say makes the argument even less relevant, I went through the list of, from the State Board of Elections, candidate filings, and I looked at every district to see who was running. I found out that in the Senate, 19 of the 59 senators are in the middle of a four-year term, so they're not even on the ballot. So there's, there's 40 that are there. Of that 40, 11 have a challenge. The others have a free ride. All they have to do is show up on election day, vote for themselves, and they're in. That's seven Democrats and four Republicans. So that means you have 48 safe votes. You look at the House, all 118 seats are up. There are 44 with contests, 44 incumbents who face a contest in November. So that means there's 74 who are safe. Now, some of those are people who are going to retire and, and not running again, so they're, they're like doubly safe. Uh, conceivably, if I vote for it this November, somebody might be ticked off enough and still remember it two years from now. But if you're a decent lawmaker, you have two years to show the public, this is why we did it. Uh, and it works with capital projects. Lawmakers, when George Ryan pushed through his Illinois First program for, for public works, and we raised, uh, what did we raise? We raised the alcohol tax, we raised license fees. 
people voted for it. And the reason was they could come home and they say, well, I know you don't want to pay more, but on the other hand, you know that, that high school gym roof that leaked? It's going to be fixed. And you know that, that road, that frontage road that's turned to oatmeal? It's going to be paved. And people trusted George Ryan to do it, and he did. And so if you explain to people, here's the benefit you get from paying more, you should be able to convince them that it makes sense, or at least enough of them, that you're not going to get beaten, particularly if there's nobody running against you. That's about as good as it gets. So anyway, that, that's my take. Um, based on my experience, I would think, yeah, we can get it done. Reasonable people sit down, work this stuff out, and we all go home. Based on the way things have been positioned, based on the attitude of the governor, based on the recalcitrance of Madigan in particular, to a lesser extent, Cullerton, uh, I have my doubts. And, and part of it is just the attitude. One, one final anecdote, if you will. You may have noticed that some of the governor's staff people have been very disrespectful to legislators, uh, to the point of being very rude, which again is something new. And I recall years ago, and some of you who are from the Metro East area may recall, there was a state legislator named Wyvetter Young. Does anybody remember Wyvetter? Okay. She was an African-American woman. She was a diligent fighter for her district. She came up with all kinds of economic development plans, some of which were workable, others that weren't. But she was 100% for the district. And she had a question that she posed to the Department of Transportation. And they blew her off. And they were kind of snotty with her. And so, and this was in the spring. And when the Department of Transportation's budget came up in the Illinois House, it received not a single yes vote from either a Republican or a Democrat. And why better was a Democrat. And it was a way of the House to send a message she may not be in leadership. She may just be a rank and file lawmaker. She may be a minority, but by God, she's a member of the Illinois House and you treat her with respect. And so the Department of Transportation made their apologies, answered her question, and then later on in the final, like the last day, everything got cleared up, they snuck through a, a department budget for transportation. That's the kind of respect that I think is missing and that you really need if we're going to get something done. And I guess our role as constituents is to encourage our lawmakers to work together, put aside this partisan bickering, this upstate versus downstate, Chicago versus the rest of the state, and do what's best for the people. So at this point, if anybody has any questions or any rebuttal, I'd be glad to entertain them. Yeah. I noticed the governor um, in his interview with the Tribune yesterday referred to the collectivist economy of Illinois and um, that whenever he refers to the people of Illinois, it's always as taxpayers, not as citizens, which completely changes yeah. the relationship that we have with one another and we have with the collective. And so I'm curious uh, to hear your read. Is anyone talking about that? I've yet to hear anybody I, talk about the governor's that, language. That was the first time I'd heard him use that. But I don't, you know, I'm not with him 24-7, so yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, it really surprised me. And it maybe reflects where he came from. He's certainly not appealing to our better angels. Oh, no, no. <laughs> but then, in, and, and this, let, let me give you a little background about me so you understand where I'm coming from. Uh, as you heard, after I got out of grad school, I spent three years in the Republic of Panama in the Peace Corps. What I did was to basically work for the Catholic bishop there who was very much into social justice. And he had a, a, a wing of the diocese that didn't have anything to do with theology or going to church, none of that stuff, but it was all about economic justice. So we organized subsistence level peasants into cooperatives so that they would have collective power to buy goods, collective power to sell their produce. And so I spent three years doing that. So I'm a firm believer in, quote, collective activity. 
Uh, on the other hand, were I a venture capitalist, or as some people say, a vulture capitalist, who went in, looked at companies, busted the company up, sold off the pieces and walked away with a lot of money, employees, too bad. Um, I might have the attitude that, you know, why should my tax dollars go to pay for some, uh, some homeless person? Why doesn't that person get a job? Or here's this teenage mom and she's got a kid. Why didn't she keep her legs together back when she was in high school? You know, that kind of a attitude. I personally find that reprehensible. But that's because I guess I'm a collectivist in the sense I think we're all responsible for one another. And not to sound preachy, but at the end of the day, what counts isn't how much money you have in your account, but that you can look back and say, here's what I did, my little bit, so that maybe my town, my state, my country, the world is a better place for me having been here. So I don't agree with his attitude, but that seems to be what motivates him. That's what his antipathy towards unions is. Hmm? It's a difference between an oligarchy and a yeah. And sometimes I wonder about that. You know, there's a, I guess, a, a train of thought that I always ascribe to the tinfoil hat element, saying that what the governor really wants to do is to wreck the state. He wants to bust ask me. He wants the state to go bankrupt uh, so that he can get out from under labor agreements. Uh, why should Catholic charities be providing these services? There's some company that can do it. Some for-profit company that can take over and make money, and investors can make money. Why should we have all these public universities? Why not shut down Eastern, sell it to somebody, and they can run, you know, the Illinois version of Trump U? Why, why do we have $26 billion going into K-12 education, most of it going to those rotten teachers for the CTU or the IEA or the Illinois Federation of Teachers, and none of it, relatively little of it, going into investors' pockets. If we go with charter schools and if we bust the teachers' unions and if Chicago schools go bankrupt, then the private sector can get in there and some of that $26 billion will go into investors' pockets. Now, that's been suggested that that's what he's driving at. I would hope that's not true, and I would hope that is the, you know, the, the, the wacko element, but you have to wonder sometimes. Any other? Not, thank you very much for, oh, I'm sorry. No, time out, time out. Another question. Uh, Yeah, that's, that's the, the notion of starving the beast, where we don't provide the resources and then we don't have to provide these services. There are people who feel that way. There's this whole school of thought, as I said earlier, that if you have problems, it's your own fault. You know, uh, And I find that difficult to go back to the, the case of, of the teenage mom. Is it her baby's fault? You know, or someone who's born with a developmental disability, is it that person's fault? Now, millennia ago, yeah, if you were born with a disability, it was because uh, God was, you know, taking it out on you. As a matter of fact, when I was in Panama, there was an oligarchy that controlled a lot of the economic resources. And what they used to tell the peasants was, well, I have all this money and you don't have anything. But on the other hand, you'll get your reward in heaven. <laughs> and that used to annoy the dickens out of me. And so we'd, we'd, we'd work with the people and say, well, you know, you, you're not destined to be poor. Circumstances you find yourself in might make you poor now, but you can do something about it. So if you get together collectively, in this cooperative, you'll maybe be able to have more market influence, maybe do better for yourself. 
and, and our bishop was wonderful. There was, uh, one of our volunteers was, was a Cuban-American. He was an immigrant who fled Cass, uh, take over the island. And so the, the rich people, the people at the top, we used to call them Robbie Blancos, uh, would argue, they tell the peasants, don't listen to him because he's a communist. And so finally, this was in a remote area. Bishop went up there and he talked to everybody and he threatened those landowners if they didn't get off Mario's case, he would send them to hell. <laughs> And, and the people believed him. I'm not sure the landowners did, but the people believed him. And so they kind of let Mario alone. But yeah, it's, it's a problem that I think the evidence suggests is happening in this country. Most of the economic growth over the last several decades has accrued to a certain element in our society, the folks at the top. Folks in the middle uh, have lost ground. Folks at the bottom are kind of where they've always been except now there's more of the folks who used to be in the middle are kind of sliding into the bottom. I think that's what fuels a Bernie Sanders. That's what fuels a Donald Trump, to, to cite two totally dissimilar personalities. But I think that's out there. The, the electorate feels, a lot of people feel, I'm really getting the shaft. I'm not really sure who's to blame, but, but I'm angry about it. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. but. Well, I, I want to thank you very much for being patient, listening to me, listening to me.